virtual book signing. I'm Daniel Weinberg, and we're at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop as usual. Uh, it's uh, actually not a bad day outside, and we still have quite a crowd in here, which I'm happy for. And if it's snowing where you are, you're on your couch with a margarita watching us, I'm happy for you. Uh, by the way, you're watching live. I hope that during this discussion today, the hour plus, uh, that if you have any questions to email in, please do that. We'll try to get them answered live while we are live. If you're on our archive afterward and watching, we hope to have first edition signed books still left for you. And of course, look at the other archives. We may still have some of those books as well. Uh, we're really happy today. By the way, if you email in, give us at least your first name and where you're from so we can shout out at you. Uh, so, two wonderful books today, three actually, uh, on allied things and, you know, a hundred years apart, but nonetheless uh, about assassinations and two wonderful authors that uh, have written these books. First, uh, someone who's been with us before, James Swanson, who has degrees in history and law from University of Chicago and UCLA. He's on the advisory council of Ford's Theater Society and has worked for a number of think tanks such as the Cato Institute and the Heritage Foundation. He's the author of a number of books, Manhunt, The Twelve Day Chase for Lincoln's Killer, won the Edgar Award and is pretty well known probably to most of you, uh, and Bloody Crimes, the follow-up, The Funeral of Abraham Lincoln and The Chase for Jefferson Davis. He co-authored with me Lincoln's Assassins, Their Trial and Execution, The Pictorial History of the Trial and Execution. Today's book, his latest, are these two actually uh, that flow from one another. One is End of Days, The Assassination of John F. Kennedy, an adult book, uh, or those who are younger who might be able to read this. William Morrow is a publisher, 398 pages and heavily illustrated. It's 29.95. This will get you first edition signed if you even want to get uh, gifts for someone. And also a book for younger readers, The President Has Been Shot, the Assassination of John F. Kennedy. Scholastic Press published it, 270 pages, also quite heavily illustrated. I think re younger readers will enjoy that and maybe even get into history, just as you and I got into history from Kuhnhardt's 20 Days uh, on the Lincoln assassination. This might do it for history for your younger readers, too. It's 1895. And also we're happy to have uh, Thomas Bogar, uh, who taught theater history, dramatic literature, and theatrical production for 40 years, most recently at Hood College in Frederick, Maryland. He's directed over 70 theatrical productions, and he holds a PhD in theater history, literature, and criticism from LSU. Uh, he has an MA in play directing uh, and a BA in educational theater, both from the University of Maryland. He's the author of some previous books as well, American Presidents Attend the Theater, and a biography of John Owens, a 19th century actor and manager. His writing has appeared in Washington History, Maryland Historical Magazine, Teaching History, Teaching Theater, I'm sorry, and Music Educators Journal. He is a recipient of two National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowships and served as a judge for Washington's Helen Hayes Theater Award. His book today is Backstage at the Lincoln Assassination. Henry Rebnery or Revenue History, I guess, is what I should say now, uh, is the publisher, 377 pages, and it's $27.95. Each of these are fascinating books, and you're going to get a lot of information on whether the, you've lived through, as I did, the Kennedy uh, assassination, or uh, if you lived through the Lincoln assassinations, I seem to do all the time right here in the shop. <laughs> Uh, so I think I'm going to start out, uh, Tom, with you. Um, you did something uncommon, I think, in the Lincoln field, and that is you've produced an original book uh, with new interesting facts concerning the Lincoln assassination. It's a readable study that uh, it was truly like to be behind the scenes in the theater, how the cast and crew themselves were implicated by Booth's actions. How did you get to this book? I presume, of course, from your theater background, but what got you interested in this particularly? I was working on the Lincoln chapters of the American Presidents and the Theater book, and every time that I came across that iconic playbill for our American cousin, I kept looking at those names thinking, 
who are these people? Uh, because I look at everything through the theater history angle, and, and the context of this signal event in American history was in a theater by practicing living human theatrical artists. And I thought, well, I thought certainly somebody had written about them. And, and every study that I looked at, every version of it, either followed the president being carried out across the street to his death in the Peterson House across the street, or Booth out the back door, as in the wonderful book by Mr. Swanson, The Manhunt, with inevitably him being followed by the, the metaphorical camera out the back door and then his death in that burning tobacco barn. And nobody had considered these actors and managers who were trapped in the theater, the soldiers rushing in, uh, the mob in the street chanting, burn the place down, the soldiers telling them they can't leave, uh, some of them knowing more than others about what was going on, others completely innocent, but, but all of them really terrified, and nobody had written it. And I thought, okay, I need to do this. You know, someone has written a, a book on the audience reactions many of them taken much later, but mm -hmm. nonetheless, how the audience was there reacted to the assassination. Um, but you seem to imply that maybe it's more reliable to look at what was happening inside the theater. Well, it's a 180 degree spin from looking from the audience. I'm trying to tell the story looking from the actors backstage in the dark, because remember, this is before electric lights, so we've got the smells and the sounds backstage looking out into the audience, waiting for that delayed curtain to start, waiting for the presidential party to arrive. As the curtain goes up, they're looking, and, and the reader's looking from their point of view out into the audience. And a number of them commented, too, at, at events during the performance, such as seeing Booth come in the back and walk behind the audience. So the perspective is different than that from the audience. And, and hopefully I've put the reader on stage looking out rather than in the audience looking at exactly the stage. Exactly what you've done. Um, James, you know, I'm going to be balancing the two of you here. Uh, although we have a lot of connections, and I expect some cross-pollination between these two. Uh, the End of Days certainly is an exciting story. It has a quick pace style. And how, but how do you view the book? A good, well-written book to give a viewpoint, new information? What's your point of view on this? Well, what I'm trying to do is tell the story as I think it happened. And I try to write all my books like true crime thrillers. Mm -hmm. Deeply researched, with lots of notes, lots of research, but written for regular people. People like us, not, not PhDs in history, not professors, not political scientists. I want the books to take people back in time. So the political scientists read this as well? And be able to oh yeah, yeah, but there's lots of interesting information that I think has not been presented in this way before. But my, my first goal is to tell a thrilling, exciting, and terrifying story. I want my books to read like novels, even though they're completely true. But I want them to have that novelistic pace of the ticking clock, the, the hour by hour, minute by minute, and sometimes in the case of what happened in Neely Plaza, split second like by split second. I want readers to feel they're driving in the motorcade, that they're looking out the window from the sixth floor and they're seeing Oswald's perspective from his point of view. Yeah. That's why I do the book. Actually, right in the middle of it, I was going to call you and say, don't tell me how it ends. <laughs> I'm enjoying this. Don't tell me. But. Well, that's the problem with writing books like this. The minute the reader picks it up, they already know the end of the story. It's like writing a book about the Titanic. How do you make that suspenseful? Because before you even pick up the book, you know they hit the iceberg and everybody dies. You know, Kennedy dies, Lincoln dies. How do we make it exciting and interesting to the reader and let them imagine it didn't have to happen the way it did? Because history yeah, is in history until it happens. That. You talk about that. Uh, at the same time, you were saying how it's a novelistic approach. There's a lot of dialogue in here. Yeah. There's a lot of internal thinking in here. How do you get that and show a reader that it's, that's not exactly maybe what it was or was it? Well, in the case of the dialogue, both in Manhunt and in End of Days. The dialogue is verbatim, whether it comes from Marina Oswald, comes from Jacqueline Kennedy, from Dave Powers and Kenny O'Donnell, two of the president's top aides, from testimony, from tape recordings, from television that I saw of the president's arrival at Love Field. If it's in my book, and it's in quotation marks, someone said it or someone wrote it, mm -hmm. and I haven't made it up, I haven't manufactured it, I haven't altered it. Anything in, in quotation marks was really said or written by other people. So I'm very strict about that. Um, Tom, you alluded to something here that I was going to talk about a little later, but now that you did, I'm going to uh, ask it. I've asked, asked this question before. 
about the theater. And uh, once asked a question about, <coughs> sure, the, the Ford's theater was easy for Booth. He could easily get around and do what he needed to do. But at the same time, it was the theater. And he was an actor. And he, I think, had to have felt the stage presence of what he was going to do. No different, I bet, than Oswald. He was on a huge stage there. So did both of them feel that? Did each of them feel that they were really performing for the world? Booth was always on. He was the center of attention. I, I love a comment by Clara Morris, the actress, who said even when we were acting with him on stage or when we were in a room with him, we were like sunflowers turning our face to the sun. Just the, the magnetism, the charisma that was there. So he was aware of that. And everything that he did, even in everyday life, had a, a flair to it, just a flamboyance. Do you see any of that? This, by the way, behind me is Edwin Booth. <coughs> and do you see any of that flair in Edwin by the Edwin, as, photos, as Nora Titon pointed out in, in her wonderful book, uh, My Thoughts Be Bloody, was the trend toward the new evolution of acting toward a more a realistic style uh, just before the Stanislavski era in the 1890s. So their style is different because Wilkes is much more dramatic f and uh, striking poses, whereas Edwin's was more realistic as people would be in a room and indeed were in the 20th century in their acting. We'll talk a bit about that, but you're saying that Edwin was already doing that at this time during the Civil War? He was starting. He, he was showing beginning trends toward it mm -hmm. and a more realistic interpretation of dialogue rather than um, almost what you see with John Lovett in acting Shakespeare that you sure. would see. And Edwin got away from that. He was already moving away well, from that. Charlton Heston doing the Gettysburg Address. <laughs> right, right. What about Oswald? Well, that was not Oswald at all. There are many similarities in the personalities and characters of Abraham Lincoln and John Kennedy. You wouldn't believe it, but there are. There are many similarities between their ends, their funerals, and how the nation mourned them. But I can't think of two people who are more different than John Wilkes Booth and Lee Harvey Oswald. As you say, Booth was on stage. He performed the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. He wanted to be seen and he wanted to be known. That's why he leaped to the stage. That was really his best escape route. But he wasn't wearing disguise. He could have worn a false beard. He could have shaved his mustache. He could have concealed who he was. But instead, he jumped to the stage. He paused. He raised that bloody dagger. It's as though he's saying, it is I, look at me. It is I, John Wilkes Booth, who has slain the tyrant. He wanted the 1,500 or 1,800 people in that theater to see him and know that he did it. And then he cries out a motto, six separate tyrannus. Then according to one of the witnesses, before he leaves the stage, vanishes into the wings, he exclaims to himself, I have done it. Oswald is a man in the shadows, lurking in the shadows. Oswald was a lifelong nobody. He wasn't celebrated like John Wilkes Booth. He was a high school dropout at age 15. He was a loser in the U.S. Marine Corps. He learned to do one thing well in the Marine Corps, and that's shoot a rifle. He uh, had delusions of grandeur of his whole life. He wanted to be an author. He wanted to be a political defector. He wanted to be a star. He wanted to be known. He wanted to be recognized. He never achieved any of that. That's partly the reason why he killed John Kennedy, because of his lifelong failures to be somebody. I can't think of two assassins who are more different than John Wilkes Booth and Lee Harvey Oswald. Each of them seem to seem to come to the assassination of respective presidents uh, fairly late in the moment. 